I'm Sarah Phillips with the Kodiak Chamber of Commerce, the host of Comfish Alaska 2020, coming to you again virtually this afternoon. We have some nice morning sessions that have been recorded and uploaded onto our website. They're taking a little bit time to render, so if they're not there right this second, they will be there this evening. You can see them at comfishak.com. Depending on where you're tuning in with us today, you might be on YouTube on the Comfish Alaska channel, and or you might be on Facebook on our Comfish page. Either way, if you are on YouTube or Facebook, you do have the opportunity to make a comment right on that video today for any of our presenters. We have about a 30 second to a one minute long lag time, so we might not see your question right as the topic comes up, but we'll see your question. Eventually, we'll, we'll let the presenters know. I'll go ahead and moderate that to them, and we'll get that signal to them. If you are tuning in on our website, comfishak.com, the best way to make a comment or ask a question of one of our presenters is to go ahead and just call our office. That number is 907-486-5557. So without any further ado, I'd like to get our Mariculture How Do I Get Started panel started. Today we have Tamsin Peoples, Paul Dobbins, Lexa Mayer, Alf Pryor, and Riley Smith joining us, um, all from diverse backgrounds, but all here to talk about Mariculture. So we're going to go get go ahead and get started with Paul Dobbins. Paul is a retired seaweed and mussel farmer from Maine and now works with WWF as Director of Impact Investing and is the lead for seaweed and shellfish initiatives. That was almost a tongue twister there. Well, well done there, Paul. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in to this virtual conference. And uh, Tamsin, if you could put up the, the first slide. All right. So uh, as Sarah stated, I work for WWF now, World Wildlife Fund, we're the largest conservation organization in the world. And we have a project called Advancing Aquatic Farming for Climate Games. And it focuses on seaweed farming and shellfish farming for the ecosystem services that they provide, the nutritious food product and biomass they provide, and for the jobs in the coastal communities that they can create. I get to the next slide, Tamsin. So uh, I'm gonna go through these slides rather quickly. I hope they just leave an impression uh, because I am gonna move fast. We only have about five minutes. And I'm gonna talk about what I see are trends around the world and uh, how they may relate to the Alaska mariculture business. So the first on the left is a graph of the growth of seaweed production globally. You can see that it's a very steep curve. And this is uh, back in 2012. We think that the harvest this year will be about 32 million metric tons of farmed uh, seaweed. And when you think of seaweed, we tend to think of the kelps because those are the environments that we're in. This is Laminaria japonicus off the coast of Korea. And so this conversation will focus mostly on the kelps. So about half the industry is uh, red and the green seaweeds as well. And I'm going to focus on the areas of Korea, uh, a little bit on the North Atlantic, uh, because those are areas that are similar and they have species similar to what grows in Alaska. The kelp on the right is Laminaria japonicus. It's a beautiful kelp. You can see that it has tremendous uh, size. That will grow to about three to four feet in width and about 26 to 28 feet in length by the time it's ready to harvest. They used to be about as small as the sugar kelps that we grow, but through strain selection, the Koreans have been able to increase their yield, increase their temperature tolerance and disease resistance. So a theme for this talk is nursery. If I could have the, the next slide, please, Tamsin. So this is uh, one of the, the largest nurseries in the US. It's located on the East Coast. And to give you an idea of the scale of this industry, uh, this nursery produces about 40 miles of seed string in a season. And you can see that there's rather complex machinery and a lot of equipment that's involved in that. And if I could have the next slide, please, Tamsin. This is a seaweed nursery in Korea. You can see that it's a, a lot less 
seemingly technically sophisticated in a lot larger. Where the nursery in the US was producing 40 miles of seed string, this nursery produces 1,100 miles of seed string and does so with a lot less equipment. How did they do that? They've learned over time what are the, cre the, the key critical success factors for getting seed out inexpensively. And that's really the name of the game. The nursery is one of the most expensive components, no matter where you go in the world, of seaweed farming. And getting to that scale and getting the, that price down is the key to competitiveness in the marketplace. If I could have the next slide. Now, near that seaweed nursery in Korea, which, you know, if you look at that, it was basically a greenhouse with a sand filter, is a really, really sophisticated seaweed laboratory. One of the, the key metrics that I look at when I look around the world for the opportunity for a seaweed industry to really compete is the money being spent on strain selection and uh, and strain propagation. This walk-in cooler at a research facility in Korea is where they do a lot of the strain work to create those species or strains of species that have that ability to produce that incredible yield per foot of long line. And that's really the name of the game. You wanna be able to produce as much product as you can for a given farm size and for the money that you're investing in that farm. Uh, Korea sees the seaweed industry as a strategic imperative, not only at the federal level, but this particular research facility is a municipal research facility uh, for a town of about 60,000 people. Shows you how important seaweed mariculture is to their coastal communities, that they're willing to invest this kind of money to make sure that they're competitive. Next slide, please. Tamson, may I have the next slide? Thank you. Now, if you have all that seed, how do you get it out onto the farm in a really efficient fashion? And uh, one of the things that we're seeing develop around the world in both mature seaweed uh, markets such as Asia and in uh, developing seaweed markets such as North America and Europe is technology to help with both seeding and harvesting. The image on the left is a compilation of images taken of a seeding machine that helps wind the seed string around the line as we typically do here in North America. It's run off of the battery of an outboard of a boat. It's really light. People just pick it up and go and many families share this seeder and it's really fast. You can really fly through the seed uh, with this particular seeder. The one on the right there is a seed machine that takes six inches or four inches of seed string, cuts it and then inserts it into that line. And that also is really, really fast, but that's done on shore. The line is put into, um, into uh, line baskets and then taken out onto the farm and dispersed. Some farmers like the method on the left, some farmers like the method on the right. The upshot is both of them are really, really fast and not labor intensive. If I could have the next slide. This is a video I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna switch from, from nursery into farm design. This is in the Faroe Islands, and this is a farm design that was evolved to handle really, really harsh conditions. And if you're gonna to wanna to expand out into areas where there may be room, uh, but the conditions are harsh, you're gonna to have to have a farm design that can withstand those conditions. Tamson, if you just play the video. Um, this, this particular farm design has ridden out hurricanes with winds of 130 miles an hour and wave heights of 30 feet. It is being uh, deployed now out into the open ocean where it will experience conditions this winter of wave heights of 50 feet and winds in excess of 150 miles. What I like about this illustration is it shows that your farm design um, is really needs to be uh, created in for the environment you work in, the species and the socioeconomic conditions in which you operate. And for us, where we have fairly high cost structure, we have to figure out how to do farm design in a way that we're not putting all of our money into the farm 
that there is some money left over for operations. And so what I have seen around the world is that the key is getting that farm strong enough to withstand the conditions, but cheap enough so that you can actually make money farming. That's a real key sustainability metric. If I could have the next slide, please. This is, a, uh, this is a farm that's not too far away from the farms in the Faroes. This is off the coast of Norway. And this is, though it looks similar on the surface, this is a very different farm setup. We have the typical, what looks like the long lines going back and forth. The way they've set up this farm now, and I think you can advance one Tamsin and then advance another and another, that yellow line actually represents the seeded long line, if you will. So they've taken and created kind of a cat's cradle between their backbones. And what this has allowed them to do is to get significantly more yield out of an acre or a hectare or however you're measuring it. And what they're doing is they're seeding their long line directly. They're avoiding the seed string and they're deploying their long line straight from the nursery. And uh, this has implications for nursery design, but it makes seeding exceedingly quick and harvesting, and you can see they're just about to launch a new harvest barge, their harvesting also becomes really, really efficient. They've thought out of the box, I've never seen a farm set up like this anywhere in the world, and it really works for them. Next slide, please, Tamsin. The other thing that we see as we travel around the world are uh, industry-specific boats. So this boat in Korea is specifically evolved over the last 40 years for harvesting seaweed. It's really efficient. It takes one person to operate the boat and they can bring in um, anywhere from, from 10 to 20 tons of seaweed on that boat per harvest. It really works well for them. Um, they keep their labor costs low. The boat is not an expensive boat to build. Uh, and you see these cranes everywhere in the seaweed industry over in Asia, uh, cuts down on the amount of labor that they have to have on the boat. Next slide, please. And then I really, the, my favorite picture in all of aquaculture is this uh, anchor. These are the anchors that they use in the Korean industry, which is one of the largest seaweed industries in the world. It's just basically scrap metal that they take and they weld with some rebar. And we always think a lot about anchors. I mean, that's how you sleep at night. They've had so much experience in seaweed farming that they figured out how to make the cheapest, lightest anchor that still works. And it really does. That image on the right is a typhoon that came across the coast as we were there on the uh, 6th and 7th of October. And the seaweed farms rode it out just fine. And it shows that their 40 years of experience showing through. Where the Koreans put their money in seaweed farming is, uh, is really in the nursery and in the research and creating the strains. So that's where the majority of the capital, if you will, in the Korean seaweed industry is spent. And they've figured out how to farm very economically given their experience. If I get a next slide, please, Damson. Um, then the other thing to think about is underutilized species. So we're starting to see an emergence of more species being farmed. 10 years ago, there were about 28 species farmed. Right now, there are about 50, just under 50. Uh, this is an example of a species that didn't have a Latin name when people started farming it on the East Coast, and it now represents over half of all the cultivated seaweed on the East Coast. The reason being is that it was discovered that this seaweed processes really easy, creates a product that consumers love. And so one of the things that we counsel new regions that are developing seaweed farms is to go out there and look at what's in the water. There may be things in there that aren't even described in the textbooks yet that might provide significant opportunity economically for a seaweed farmer. Next slide. Uh, I wanna shift to markets now. And uh, we see uh, three big markets evolving in the future for seaweed. The first and what we think may be the largest is animal feed. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about enteric methane uh, production reduction in cows uh, when they eat seaweed. I think there's still a lot of research that needs to happen, but uh, animals eat seaweed uh, as a matter of course. They're looking for the micronutrients that they don't get in their 
forage. And there are companies over in Europe and uh, in Asia and in Australia that actually their business is creating products out of seaweed for production animals to improve their health and productivity. And we think that this is only gonna increase as time goes on, particularly with the interest around uh, methane reduction. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, another evolving market, and this is the snack food market. I like, this is a company out of Scotland. I really like the products that these, this company and some of the com companies in Europe are developing. They're not going down the traditional path of what seaweed products look like that come from uh, the Asian producing areas. They're developing products that work specifically for the culture in which the seaweed is grown. And they're be being very successful as a result of that. So we're seeing in emerging seaweed markets, they, a whole new line of products that disassociate themselves from the traditional seaweed products that we see uh, coming from the Asian markets. Next slide, please. And then this is the last one. Um, another emerging market we see is biodegradable bioplastics uh, from seaweed. And I love this picture. The Glenn Livett company did a promotion where they created seaweed pods and uh, filled with their booze and went out and uh, had people try them all around Europe. And what I love about this is uh, Glenn Livett, when you think about it, is a solvent. And here we have an edible pouch that can stand up to a solvent and it's made out of seaweed. See, plastics from seaweeds are not a new concept. In World War II, the UK made its cellophane out of seaweed because oil was literally priceless because they're not an oil producing nation. And so it's not necessarily a new idea, but the new technologies that are coming out in biorefining have a lot of promise to really expand the seaweed market. And I think, I think that's it for my presentation. So I look forward to any questions. And I wanna say that I'm available at any time to answer questions that anyone in Alaska or anywhere else may have about what we've learned about seaweed farming and markets. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. You made me both hungry and ready for happy hour at the same time, thanks. <laughs> um, next up, we are going to touch base with Lexa Mayer. She is the Alaska Mariculture Manager for Blue Evolution, overseeing hatchery operations and processing in the 49th state. She's been a fisheries biologist at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and also commercial fish, fisheries for salmon with her husband in the kelp off season. She is excited by the economic opportunities and the ecological benefits kelp farming provides. So Lexa, we'll go ahead and have you kick off your presentation. Wonderful, thank you. I um, appreciate everyone tuning in this afternoon. And uh, you did a wonderful introduction, so I just think I can skip that. So we can go to the next slide, please, Damson. And this is actually a little video, so if you wouldn't mind playing this, this is just a snapshot from one of our farms here in Kodiak. And this is Saccharina latissima, or sugar kelp, growing beautifully in the clean, clear waters off of Kodiak, Alaska. And so we're very proud of this. Um, we feel at Blue Evolution, we're one of the uh, people in the forefront that have brought kelp mariculture and really expanded kelp mariculture within the state of Alaska. Next slide, please, Tamsin. And so this is basically what we do. Um, we grow seaweed. And, um, you know, Bo Perry, the founder of Blue Evolution, started with um, numerous kind of aquaculture endeavors, everything from shellfish to shrimp farming, and really latched on to seaweed farming because of its low ecological out, you know, impacts. It really doesn't have any ecological impacts. It has ecological benefits. And uh, so that's where we've landed as a company. And this is what we do. And there's uh, the picture there with the lovely green seaweeds and everyone gazing up fondly. That's actually from our Mexico operation where we grow ulva or sea lettuce. And then there's a smiling picture of one of our farmers, Nick Mangini, standing next to beautiful totes of sugar kelp in Kodiak, Alaska. Next slide, please. So we're vertically, vertically, in, vertically integrated seaweed farming and ingredients and products company. And what does vertically integrated mean? Basically, we try to do everything from marketing, branding, research, 
growing the seed, um, recruiting farmers or growing the, the product ourselves as we do in Mexico, processing, product development, distribution, the whole deal. So we basically do it all. Next slide, please. So these are some of the reasons why we love seaweed farming. Um, I won't go into depth and read them all. That's kind of boring, but just the basic thing is, is that, um, of course, you've read a lot in the news about it, the ability of seaweed to mitigate the effects of climate change by absorbing extra CO2 in the oceans. So that's a big ecosystem benefit to seaweed farming. The other is, again, no fresh water. So we're using all salt water and just ambient salt water without adding any additional nutrients to the water. So there's no need for fossil fuel generated um, fertilizers or anything like that. Um, also here in Kodiak, we have the benefit of processing our kelp using wind powered energy. We have a large wind array here in Kodiak. And so the majority of the power generated in our town is actually wind energy. And then of course, we feel that we are also moving into these coastal communities like Kodiak and creating a myriad of jobs. We employed this year about 30 processing workers in the spring for almost two months while processing. And um, it's in a downtime between salmon fishing the start of salmon fishing and the end of ground fish fisheries in the winter time when we do our harvest in the spring. So we've brought uh, new jobs to Kodiak as well. Next slide, please. And so here's a few of the products we make. We make everything from a pasta with the dried and powdered ova or sea lettuce. Um, we're expanding into new products this year. We're very proud. You can find us on Amazon as well as some market supermarkets now. We have a popcorn that features our Mexican grown over sea lettuce as a seasoning. We sell blanched and frozen kombu and wakame. Those are the names we use. Kombu is actually the sugar kelp and wakame is the other, our product name for the um, ribbon kelp. And we sell, that's our Alaskan products. We sell blanched frozen product. We partnered here with the brewery in Kodiak to make a kelp beer. So we actually brewed beer or had the, <laughs> they brewed beer for um, the residents of Kodiak for sale uh, using sugar kelp from local farms. Next slide, please. So there's just a summary of kind of like what our role is in the emerging mariculture industry here in Kodiak and throughout Alaska. So, so far we purchased from two farms in the Kodiak area and hoping to expand our farmer portfolio as we grow. Uh, we develop these high market food products in the kelp world and, and the seaweed mariculture world. Kelp um, for food is the highest value. And then things like fertilizer and animal feed are further down the scale, but we are able to maintain a high value for our products in the market. And so we can pay our farmers accordingly, which is really nice. Um, we provide farmers with high quality kelp seed. My other job here is to also um, make kelp seed in the lab. So that's pretty exciting. So we provide all the seed that is grown here on the farms in Kodiak. We provide advice for the farmers. So if they come to us like, hey, is this a good spot to farm? Or should I apply for a permit here? We can give them some advice on site selection and sometimes on gear and species that they make grow. And then we're also working to fund research to expand farming practices. We brought a project here from the Department of Energy that um, some of our local farmers are working on and that will hopefully and has brought some new technologies and will continue to bring new technologies to Kodiak and then hatchery research as well to expand on things like direct seeding. Next slide, please. So this is a little video. This is our ribbon kelp underwater. And I'm going to talk briefly about what it takes to farm kelp. And I guess that's a little, the gift's a little sticky, but that's okay. Next slide, please. So here's basically the farming cycle. September, October, we collect wild seed stock from plants, uh, kelp plants around Kodiak, bring those into the lab, induce them to release myospores, and then um, grow kelp seed on little seed twine. And there's a picture of it there on the right. November and December, the seed string is outplanted on the farms. December through April, April, the farmers tend the farms, they monitor the growth of the plants, collect data for us. And then come May, June, we harvest the kelp over about a month, month and a half time frame. Next slide, please. So a lot of people, the first thing they ask, well, 
Is this profitable? Can I get into it for very little money? How much does it cost? So here's just a basic breakdown. Alf can expound a little bit more about this in his talk. Basically, you have to lease land from the state of Alaska. They also include a $2,500 bond that you give, and then they'll give it back if you ever decide to stop farming, but they keep that. You can just um, you know, include that in your expenses. Um, insurance is pretty expensive. It depends on infrastructure. If you have actual floating structures attached to your farm, what does it cost? It's about $2,700, but of course it goes up from there depending on vessels and infrastructure. Gear, you know, the um, cost of the, the farm lines, anchors, buoys, and then seed cost, Currently for our network farmers runs about 50 cents a foot, charge a little additional for out of network farmers, but we do grow kelp seed for a couple of farms in Southeast Alaska as well. Next slide, please. So another thing people ask is where should I put my farm? And there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, agencies that govern where the farms can go and, and decisions on permitting range from um, the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. They then send it out to everyone from the US Coast Guard, to know in the National Marine Fisheries Service and, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game will all weigh in on your location choice. But these are just some general, you know, parameters that they look at, some things to consider. And one of the big ones, of course, is existing uses by not only the local animals, but the local people in your area. So it's always good to be aware of what goes on in your community when you're choosing a farm site. Next slide, please. And then at Blue Evolution, we're trying to expand farming opportunities within Kodiak. We have a Kodiak Mariculture Park, we call it. We have our own lease and we are still currently looking for people to farm. So if you know anyone in the Kodiak area interested in possibly farming that, uh, trying their hand at farming, uh, we have the site for you. So you can practice farming while you wait for a permit, test farm design. So if you have an idea for a farm, design, you could test it there. And then testing the suitability of your vessel. Um, a lot of people have existing vessels and they would possibly like to use them, but they may need some modification in order to do so. So a great place to try those things out. And um, we do have a site available for farmers if interested. Next slide, please. And that's the end. And I guess we're saving questions till the end, correct? Uh, we we are answering questions as they come in, though we have not had um, anyone that I am aware of yet. Again, we have that lag time in our video, so I will absolutely post questions as we receive them uh, when we get those. And if you if you happen to be watching this um, after the live recording, that's just fine. You can still send us those questions, and we'll still get them to the presenters and make that connection. So up next, we have Alf Pryor, who is a lifelong Kodiak set net fisherman, artist, entrepreneur, and dedicated kelp farmer. He started farming kelp for Blue Evolution in 2016 and has spent the last four winters developing and progressing kelp mariculture in Kodiak. So welcome, Alf. Great. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, well, like I said, uh, that we're entering my uh, my fourth year in uh, kelp kelp farming here in Kodiak, Alaska, and uh, it's it's been a lot of uh, a lot of trial and error. So we when we first started four years ago, it looks very different from where we are right now. Um, kelp farming is not easy. It's uh, it's something that takes takes a lot of skill and uh, and it's something that's involving. So. Yeah, um, I'm mostly here to answer questions if people have questions on kind of specifics about, about the farming and stuff. So please, um, please if anybody has questions, please ask. Um, I can go into my background a little bit. So I have I grew up uh, set net fishing here in Kodiak. I've spent my, pretty much my lifetime doing that. Uh, about four years ago, my friend Nick Mangini, who runs uh, one of the first farms here in Kodiak, asked if I wanted to be a part of the, the first kelp harvest. I said, sure. So we got my boat and we went out there and uh, I took a look at it and I was like, wow, this is this is something I can do. Uh, kind of my background is a, is a gill netter, um, working with lines, anchors and stuff, went right along with, uh, with kelp farming. So the next year I jumped right into it. We did a, a pretty large farm, about 36,000 feet of uh, seed string and it was a big mess. <laughs> It was it was pretty successful, you know. We harvested, you know, um, 
quite a bit of kelp, but we had a lot of issues. It was a, um, there was a big learning curve. Uh, the next year, we went even a little bigger. Um, I got my own lease site here in Kodiak uh, in the Woody Island Channel, and it's a little bit more exposed site. So again, I had to um, kind of revamp and it, it was a learning process. And we had some, we, we had some tough times with it, um, but we got through it. We delivered quite a bit of kelp again. And last year we, we kind of had a bit breakthrough. So last year we were very successful growing kelp. Um, we can see up in the right hand corner kind of an aerial shot of the farm and the, uh, the farm design has come a long, long way from where we started. Um, I'm part of a project that spans, um, has partners on the East Coast and we're kind of exploring or pushing the boundaries on how much kelp you can grow in uh, the least amount of space. And so, uh, which I would not recommend for, for a, a novice or a new person, but um, uh, it's weird. We're really pushing the envelope, I think, and uh, it's 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 paying off. Um, we're seeing a lot of success. So, yeah, we're I'm excited about uh, this upcoming year and what it has to offer. Again, we will uh, we'll be we'll push the envelope and be trying new things, and it's kind of an ever evolving process. And uh, yeah, so if you have questions, please please let me know, and uh, I can help out with some specifics. One question that I have actually, because we haven't uh, received anything from our viewers just yet. What sort of a ratio do you expect between the time that you spend farming versus the time that you take to create products with production and then versus marketing? What, what's really the ratio is, can you do one without the other? And is it a different formula for everyone? Um, I'm not sure. I think it might be a question kind of for, for Lexa. On the farming side, um, unfortunately, it's it's a, you know, once we harvest it once a year. And so in order to have fresh kelp to develop for new products and stuff that only happens in the in the springtime, you miss that window. You know, you can use frozen or um, blanched product, but you have to wait till the next season to get the next the next crop. Um, you know, farming, it, it's hard to say how much time and effort you'll put into farming because everybody's different and every situation is really different as well. But I, I expect, you, would, you should expect to put quite a bit of farm or time on the farm into uh, maintenance and monitoring um, and all of that. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a just set the, set the seed and forget it. It's, it's a, you have to keep track of it because of the basically unlimited variables on the water, so. Uh, it looks like we've got a question for the panel. Where can we buy the Blue Evolution Seaweed Popcorn and how quickly do you need to process kelp before it starts to go bad? Great, I can answer those questions. So for everyone out there, if you don't have access to some of the uh, remote, the small grocery stores we're currently selling through, go to amazon.com and our popcorn, we, you can just look at Blue Evolution. We have an online store there where we sell all of our products and you can find our seaweed pasta and our popcorn on Amazon. So we'll ship just about anywhere in the world with that. And then um, the time it, from harvest to when the kelp is no longer good for anything after it's been taken out of the water, we've been able to um, keep it for about 24 to 48 hours. Now that depends on a lot of factors, how it's stored, the ambient air temperature, um, and then you, we haven't yet discerned that there's a difference between species. Uh, we primarily grow the sugar kelp and the ribbon kelp right now. Um, I would say as long as the kelp is kept in an insulated like fish tote and there's some nice clean seawater in there, we can definitely get away with up to two days of storage before we start to see a loss of product. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, I know that we still have a presentation from Tamsin Peoples and Riley Smith. And are we ready to move on to that? I don't want to cut you off early, Al. 
OK, perfect. So we will go ahead and transition on. Tamsin Peoples is a marine biologist born and raised in Juneau. She began working with Blue Evolution to develop Alaskan seaweed mariculture in 2015. Over the past five years, she has worked closely with seaweed farmers, researchers, buyers, and processors from Ketchikan to Kodiak. She is currently working on Masters of Fisheries from UAS and continues to help promote and develop seaweed mariculture across the state. And Riley Smith will be joining her and he is with AFZF. All right, this is Riley Smith. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everyone for having us here at this wonderful event. Uh, Tamsin and I will be presenting um, on mariculture progress in Alaska, opportunities and resources available to interested farmers. Next slide, please. Specifically, today's presentation will review the history of the Mariculture Task Force, recent mariculture activities and projects, the aquatic farm application product process, and AFDF's USDA project, Spawning Mariculture Business in Southwest Alaska. Next slide, please. So to begin, what is mariculture in Alaska? Importantly, it does not involve fin fish farming as it, as it is prohibited. Next slide, please. Mariculture is the enhancement, restoration, and farming of shell, shellfish and seaweeds. Species include oysters, clams, mussels, gooey duck, crab, and seaweeds, or kelp. Alaska oyster farmers primarily are focusing on Pacific oysters. Alaska seaweed farmers are currently focusing on sugar, ribbon, and bull kelp. As Lexa noted, mariculture offers economic, environmental, cultural, industrial, and food security benefits to Alaskans. So the Mariculture Task Force. So in 2014, uh, AFDF, my organization, began spearheading the Alaska Mariculture Initiative, which is a strategy to accelerate the development of mariculture in Alaska. The initiative led to the creation of the Mariculture Task Force and the adoption of the Alaska Mariculture Development Plan. That was by Governor Walker. Governor Dunleavy maintained the task force, which is now working closely with the Governor's Alaska Development Team towards the priorities identified in the plan. Next slide, please. So the task force consists of 11 members with one member from each of the Alaska Department of Commerce and Department of Fish and Game, University of Alaska and Alaska Sea Grant, and seven, in, seven representatives from an inclusive group of stakeholders in Alaska, also included our ex officio members from the DEC, DNR and NOAA. So quite a encompassing group. Next slide, please. So as part of the Alaska Mariculture Initiative, AFDF and partners produce a, a, an economic analysis of the mariculture industry so we've got an Alaska shellfish farm size feasibility study, uh, economic analysis to inform a comprehensive plan. All those are available on the AFDF website. They're very informative. Next slide, please. The plan is completed and available on the AFDF website. The plan's goal, importantly, is to grow a $100 million mariculture industry in 20 years, with dozen of near-term and long-term recommendations, research priorities, and goals. This is an important goal of the task force is to implement the priority recommendations of the plan. Next slide, please. So th there are some quite interesting kelp products which Lexa spoke to a little bit from Blue, Blue Evolution. Um, they're coming from Alaska. They're innovative and they're in development for human consumption, many of which are value added substitution products. Barnacle Foods, for instance, has a wonderful kelp salsa and bull whip hot sauce. Blue, Blue Evolution, Lexa spoke to those wonderful products. And Paul also spoke to the fact that seaweed is also used in raw material markets for livestock feed supplements, medicine, cosmetics, i.e. skin care and fertilizer. Next slide, please. Actually, Barnacle Foods did win the Alaska Seafood, Symphony of Seafood Grand Prize Award, first place retail and Juno People's Choice at last year's competition. In fact, one out of five of the entrance into the competition used in Alaska aquatic plant as a primary ingredient. Next slide, please. Paul spoke to this a little bit. You see the, uh, the Glenlivet edible whiskey pods on the left. Um, down on the right are nutraceuticals made by Oceanium. Um, this is another emerging uh, market for seaweed as a bioplastic. And actually Oceanium, a uh, UK based company has shown an interest in the Alaska mariculture industry. Um, a potential source for, for, uh, for bioplastic engineering. Next slide, please. So in February of 2020, AFDF and partners held a seaweed farmer training workshop for interested farmers in Kodiak, Ketchikan, and Sitka. 
These workshops offered interested applicants an opportunity to gain the tools and knowledge necessary to enter the emerging, emerging and promising mariculture industry in Alaska. 2020 series will resume in the winter uh, for the communities of Kodiak, Ketchikan, and Sitka. AFDF also has a host of other mariculture projects, one of which is training and technical assistance to interested mariculture entrepreneurs. Tamsin Peoples is a primary contractor on our USDA grant, spotting mariculture business in Alaska, Southwest Alaska. Next, she will speak to the grant project, including resources and technical assistance available to interested farmers in Southwest Alaska. All you, Tamsin. Thanks, Riley. So this grant is a really great opportunity for folks that really want to pursue this. If you've been interested in this for a while and really are ready to take the plunge, take the next step, this grant is enabling us to go out, do some more outreach, education, training, and then also I will be available to assist with the application project, farm design, site selection, and business planning. The timeline for this project was originally supposed to be throughout the end of this year, but due to the COVID end times, it's been prolonged to the end of September um, next year. So we still have time to get some serious work done. This grant and the goal of this is a kind of a four stages. So right now we're in the outreach and public education stage of it. We're trying to get the word out, trying to educate people about mariculture, what it is, what it entails, what it's not, um, and how people can, or communities can become involved with it. Uh, the step after the outreach, which we're hopefully moving forward to quickly, will be the site plan, um, developing technical knowledge to build and operate farms. So then going to work with individuals or communities to really start nailing down where potential kelp farms or mariculture sites can be. Uh, once we have those site plans, I'll help folks develop a business plan. Uh, so it's a template and then also looking at cost feasibility and hopefully have a uh, finite number of folks or communities that want to go forward with submitting an application for that uh, aquatic farm permit and leasing. So in summary, this is all of the deliverables that we'll be covering with this grant. Um, so we're hoping that we can start doing uh, at least six individuals uh, to help complete site plans. So then going out either um, on a call, hopefully if we have the ability to travel there in person to help them tour an area, look at potential sites. As Lexa mentioned earlier, and as Alf brought up, there's a lot of consideration to take into where exactly your site's going to be um, that can have a really strong impact on the success and viability of your operation. Um, and then once the site plan selected, help develop a business plan, um, the forecasting of cost and marketing or uh, expenditures. Um, and then the final step will be submitting those applications to Alaska Department of Fish and Game and um, uh, Natural Resources. So the permit and lease process is pretty involved. Um, Alf and Lexa can te uh, testify to exactly how involving that can be. It used to be a multi-year waiting period. Um, at times they're thinking that the waiting period is gonna be one to five years. Thankfully, DNR um, has hired two new assistants to go help assist with the uh, application processing. And now the wait time is within a single season. We've had farmers that applied this past application period which runs from January 1st to April 30th of every year and who have already received their farm permits this season. Uh, this is important because we're getting more and more applications in through the state every year. Um, in 2016, there were only four applications submitted statewide. And in 2020, um, there were 17, uh, as well as in 2019, there were 17 permits um, applied for. And 16 of those 17 um, applications from 2019 were already awarded. So you can see it's a quite um, complex system and that's what I'd be there to help you navigate with the getting a perfect application submitted and then also throughout the public comment periods, the review processes, uh, doing everything I can to help make that a solid application and smooth process. One thing that's been an amazing resource for folks that are interested in farming and then also going through with the application is this Mariculture Mapper. It's still only in the beta phase, but this is a fantastic database and um, live mapping that you can do. You can change the background mapping, whether it's gonna be USGS topo maps or NOAA charts. You can change what's being flagged up on it, like active farming sites. You can see every documented marine mammal haul out. Also eelgrass and herring spawn sites, which are, as Lexa mentioned, are crucial components of site selection. So this is a great tool for those folks who want to pursue farming and um, that I can give a help with that hand as well. So in total, if you really want to go for farming, um, 
either as a community, as a individual, um, anywhere in Southwest Alaska, and you want help or have any assistance, please do not hesitate to email uh, myself or Riley. Again, we are really looking forward and ready to go um, help a number of folks get more and more involved with this. And I think we might have just a few minutes for questions. That's right, we have about one minute to wrap up. Let me go ahead and verify really quickly with my staff that we haven't had anything else come through. I have not seen anything. So what that means is, again, if you are not watching the live recording or if you we just want more time to have these conversations. Please still make a comment on the video. Send us an email at chamber at kodiak.org or give us a call at 907-486-5557. And we can go ahead and connect you with each and every one of these panelists to go ahead and make sure that you get your questions answered. I wanna thank each of you for joining us today and thank you for bringing your expertise to Comfish. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, everyone. So up next, we have a presentation from Paul McCluskey, and he is going to be presenting on cooperative research at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, a requirement for sustainable fisheries management and protected resource conservation. I know that he has just been admitted to our presentation here, so we'll give him just a couple minutes to go ahead and get situated and get his video and audio turned on and ready to go. And in the meantime, I'd like to go ahead and introduce him. Paul McCluskey has been the Cooperative Research Coordinator for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center since 2018. He has worked as a biologist in Alaska fisheries since 1997. Paul, have we got you to be able to start? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we've got you, there you are. Okay, so am I, am I broadcasting now? You are live and set, ready to go. So <laughs> if you have a presentation you'd like to share, uh, say hello to Comfish Alaska. <laughs> All right, hello, hello, Comfish Alaska. Let me uh, share my screen here. I'm gonna, I have a, a slideshow to go through. Perfect. Let me know if you can see this. Oh, we've got it so far. Yep, looks good. Great. So um, yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, she said I'm Paul McCluskey uh, with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And I'll talk to you today about cooperative research at the Alaska Science Center. Um, as it says here, it's a requirement for sustainable fisheries management, protected resource conservation. Uh, the Science Center is a big believer in cooperative research. It's something we've done for many years and would like to continue doing into the future. Um, just briefly about myself. I I started off in Alaska in 97 as a, as a, as a fisheries observer, uh, spent 10 years working in different Alaska fisheries up there. And then before moving over to the uh, uh, NIMF side, the government side worked uh, and have been working for the science center since then. I got into cooperative research about three years ago when I took over as the science center's coordinator for what's called the national cooperative research program, which is a small pool of congressional funded money that is awarded to every science center in the US uh, and then I manage that and that supports several projects every year in Alaska. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is uh, the importance of cooperative research at the Alaska Science Center. Um, then talk a little bit about research priorities and then after that uh, an overview of some of the cooperative projects that are going on right now. Uh, got a four or five projects I want to talk about and then at the end do some uh, talk about some opportunities for you to engage in cooperative research and you know the science center's uh, future of cooperative research and how we, how I look on that. Um, briefly, just to sum up, in case you're new to the cooperative research field, um, this is the loose definition of it. You know, science activity involving two or more partners who who gain more collectively uh, together than they would separately in the pursuit of a shared goal. At the science center, that means partnering with industry, uh, com uh, Alaska communities, coastal communities academia, state and local governments, and other government agencies uh, in order to work together to resolve outstanding issues related to federal managers, management uh, fisheries and support stock assessment, bycatch reduction, and other science management research needs. Uh, the, those, those partners that we talk about, we refer to those as stakeholders. And uh, I'm going to be using that term throughout this presentation in this talk that you know, but stakeholders in, in our mind are the principal fishery stakeholders are the, are the fishermen and their representative organizations, your fishing communities and state and local governments. Everyone has a has a stake in Alaska fisheries. So uh, why do we 
think quadra research is so important. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, you can do better science uh, when you have stakeholders, knowledge, skills, and experience uh, working on a project together. Uh, a good example of this is, is our groundfish, the success of our groundfish bottom surveys, which uh, we've done for over 30 years, where we've chartered commercial fishing vessels. And on the, those vessels are manned by uh, fishermen who are familiar with Alaska waters, and it's improved the surveys. Uh, it gives a real, um, uh, a real solid credibility to those surveys and has gone a long way. Um, it also builds great relationships with Alaska, with the uh, stakeholders, the communities in Alaska, um, and improves the knowledge of everyone involved. So everybody learns, we found, when we do cooperative research. Uh, Science Center staff learn, the stakeholders learn, and uh, we, we get when we get folks on board, you know, um, who are on the grounds, it really who are on the grounds in the fisheries, it, it's always invaluable knowledge that we can we can gain from that and experience. Uh, we also like to think it, it boosts the credibility of the research that's done at the Science Center when you have the stakeholders involved, the people on the grounds, and you know, they can learn something, share that with, with their uh, partners or, or community. And, um, you know, when they're, they become participants and contributors to the science, it, it, it's better for everyone. And, uh, you know, we, we really like to build the credibility of NOAA uh, and stakeholders together when they're part of the process. And, you know, we always think the best way to have buy-in of course, is to include, uh, you know, the stakeholders, the industry, the communities, and everyone becomes a partner in the, in the project and the science is being done. Um, I'd have to, I have to be honest too. We like cooperative research because it helps address resource constraints. You know, everyone has budgets they have to deal with and shrinking budgets. And when we get uh, industry on board, uh, we can make those budget dollars uh, go further, make research dollars go further. And, um, and finally, you know, we see it as necessary to complete the mission of the Science Center. And that mission is, you know, the mission of the Alaska Science Center is to, to plan, develop, manage scientific research programs, which generate the best scientific data available for understanding, managing, and conserving Alaska's uh, marine resources. So all those things uh, are come into why, what we, what we believe, why we believe in cooperative research. Um, now, talk a little bit about some research priorities. Uh, if you're interested in cooperative research, Research. If you want to get involved in cooperative research, um, two of the things that are important to know about the Science Center, we have two documents that guide the research that we do here, um, two, two main documents. One is the Strategic Science Plan, and the other is an annual guidance memo. The Strategic Science Plan, uh, the last one was in 2017. This is a document that comes out every three to five years, and it provides guidance to, uh, to the Science Center and to, for anyone else who wants to know what, what research priorities are for the Science Center. Uh, the intent is to organize and communicate our research activities in a way that, you know, shows the full suite of our research uh, and identifies the core research and provides some transparency into what we're doing and why we're doing it. Now, that's for every three to five years. So that's a big plan. And then every year to go along with the science plan, we have what's called our annual guidance memo. And I should say both of these are available when you look on the NOAA website if, you, if you're curious about the science, what's being done here. Uh, the annual guidance memo comes out every year, just like it says, and that is a guide to what we'll be doing for research going into the uh, into the future. There we go. So here's our analyst guys memo uh, priorities. They are, um, you know, like I kind of highlighted the the main of them. There's stock assessment. Uh, we have prohibited species monitoring, catch share implementation, uh, technologies, innovative technologies, uh, bycatch mitigation and reduction, and then we have understanding environmental impacts on the fisheries in Alaska. Um, so those are some ideas that guide those projects. Uh, yeah. um, so moving into the actual cooperative research that we're doing here. Um, so we have over 70 cooperative research projects that are ongoing at the Science Center, kind of at every given time, any given time. Uh, these are partners with industry, partners with uh, academic, uh, other, other NOAA research facilities, and um, so there's 70 projects total. What I'm gonna talk mainly about here and these numbers that you see on the screen in front of you with over 30 projects with industry and coastal communities, those, those are projects that aren't just with uh, a university or another um, you know, science center in the, in the US. And then in those projects, there's over 30 ongoing, uh, either completed ongoing or recently completed at the science center um, and uh, with over 35 cooperative partners. Um, a lot of our partners have, um, you see on the screen here, that we worked with. Uh, half these projects that we have going ongoing at the Science Center were actually initiated by you know the stakeholders. They 
came to the, uh, they contacted the AFSC. They worked with, you know, connections they had here or people they knew and, uh, and, and got a project rolling. Uh, and that's really worked well for the Science Center in, the, in our last, you know, our 30, 40 years of been around that, um, you know, we have an open door policy on cooperative research and working with industry. We just really encourage it. Uh, every division program, and individual scientists can establish these contacts and can work with stakeholders on, on a proposed project. Uh, then the other fit half of these were proposed by the Science Center and came from staff who who reached out to industry to say, hey, this we want to do this particular study. Uh, is there any way you'd like to support this? Um, if Is it of mutual interest to us? And we build those relationships from there. Uh, the level of input with these projects that happen in Alaska, it varies from uh, zero dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, the zero dollar ones are, you can't put a dollar value on the experience you get when you have, you know, the experience that comes from someone who's been fishing for 30 years in an area and can contribute to a project. Um, so that, you know, when we say there's, there's no dollars being contributed, but the experience is really valuable. And then uh, some of the projects have low dollar values. Some go into the hundreds of thousands of dollars and have been ongoing for years and years. So a great relationship there with cooperative research. And then on the flip side, that's coming from the stakeholder side. On the reverse, we have projects where we've just basically been advisors on a project. Uh, and then there's other projects where we've contributed, again, you know, hundreds of thousands, if you know, it's not more to projects that have been going on for years. Um, the project focus of the, the, the focus of these 30 projects or so, a lot of them have to do with stock assessment. And that's a really broad, term when you think about it, it covers a lot of ground, uh, but improving stock assessments uh, processes to inform the stock assessments, improving stock data for fisheries dependent data. Um, another big one is bycatch reduction, uh, but we also have projects that have happened in uh, marine mammals, uh, ecosystem understanding, uh, improving surveys and in habitat. So now uh, I'm going to highlight four projects that we've been working on here at the Science Center uh, that involves um, you know, communities in Alaska and industry folks. Uh, the first is tracking seasonal movement of adult male ring king crab in Bristol Bay. This is a project uh, where we partnered with the, with the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation. Uh, it's been going on for several years now. Uh, we've been partnered with, with various projects with them for a dozen years, probably. But this particular one has been going on for, for two or three years. Uh, and this is the idea that uh, putting acoustic tags on crab, and then they launch a sail drone, which you see in the, in the photo here. Um, which is an autonomous surface drone, wind powered, uh, with um, you know batteries and solar power, uh, controlled by satellite, and that can that just cruises through the ocean, or through the Bering Sea, detecting these acoustic tags. And what they're looking for here, the goal is to uh, look at the distribution, movement, and essential habitat of red king crab, and look at um, you know are, are the crab staying in the king crab savings area where we think they are? Or are they moving into areas where um, outside of that savings area where they could potentially be bycatch for trawl for trawl vessels. Uh, this next slide, it shows once that uh, the, you see the sail drone in the water and uh, on the left side, what you see is a, a red line and kind of a back and forth. This is what the sail drone does. Once those tag, those crab are tagged and they tagged 150 of them last year. Um, and then later in the year, they release the sail drone and it basically kind of mows the lawn across uh, the Bering Sea looking for those tags. On the right, you see in the green, and with this kind of the circular circular pattern, once it detects an acoustic tag, it's programmed to do circles out and around that area to a certain mile range, uh, looking for other crab, because the crab tend to school up and travel in groups, so looking for more crabs. Uh, and what they found with the data from October was that they located 50 tags, and um, what they found with those is that the crab are actually moving in the in historically they've always moved to the east at this time of year uh more further into the king crab savings area but what they found with these crab are moving to the west out of the king crab savings area um so the thought there is uh, uh it could be temperature changes they're really not sure but it's typically it's kind of unusual for them to move in that in that direction so um more data is needed to come up with some conclusions but this information can feed into the stock assessment uh, and, and useful for that. And um, so what the plan was for 2020 was to release another 300 tags and send the sail drone out uh, to search there, but that got delayed due to COVID-19 concerns. Uh, we did manage to get on a Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation vessel, tag uh, the 300 crab, just waiting now to deploy the sail drone, which has been, like I said, has been delayed. But uh, that 
it's been a, it's been a very successful partnership and a, and a very successful uh, project. Uh, this next one is falls under our electronic monitoring program. This was a partner with the Alaska Fishery, Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association, uh, and uh, West Coast Trawl, and also PAC Pacific States and the Northwest Fishery Science Center and Halibut Commission. A lot of a lot of people contribute to these projects. Um, this is called Man on Deck, and what it is uh, in the for for uh, electronic monitoring on longline vessels. To get the cameras to start, they have to hook up a hydraulic sensor on board. Um, this is time consuming, can be costly, and can be sometimes unreliable. And what the human presence detector, presence detector is, is actually cameras. The existing cameras that are used for monitoring can be, the computer can be programmed and those cameras can be used to, de to basically detect the presence of movement on the deck. And so uh, when someone is on the deck moving around, the cameras can begin to roll. But it gets it goes beyond that where you can actually designate an area on deck where they can stand and uh, and the camera won't operate until they're in that area. So for the roller man, until he approaches the rail of the vessel and fish start coming on board uh, and stands in that spot, the cameras won't activate. Uh, this is could potentially be more reliable, could save a lot of time and a lot of money uh, with those sensors. And I have a short video here if we can get this to go, where you'll see. Um, There'll be a yellow box and a green box bouncing on top of each other when the video starts rolling. That is what the computer was programmed to detect. And then the green is what it actually detected. And you'll see uh, there's the roller man standing there. And this box was what the, pro the, the, the man on deck software was programmed to detect when there's a person in this, in this area, they'll roll the, uh, the camera will start rolling. And they had some great success with it. Again, um, this was something, Something that was developed in-house at FMA, or the Observer Program, and the Electron Monitoring Group, and then they went to seek, uh, they went to Alpha to see if they could get some vessels to test this on, and they were happy to help with that. So that's the collaboration there that has proved pretty good. They were going to do it again this year, but once again, coronavirus uh, delayed that. They're going to be doing it in, in 2021. Uh, this now we move into some uh, bycatch reduction. This is the uh, basically looking at salmon salmon bycatch reduction in the trawl fishery, the pelagic trawl fishery, and this is a collaboration with industry and other partners to evaluate ways to reduce uh, bycatch and bycatch mortality. Uh, this program or this project, um, you see the list of cooperative partners there. I won't read them off for you, but uh, in the background of this photo, you see the net, and what the design is, of the net is that the the water flows from left to right. This is a flume tank in, in uh, uh, St. John, Newfoundland, where they were testing this. You have the cod end on the far right, and then in the middle you have the escapement area. And the idea is the fish funnel through into the cod end, but where the, the tow speed uh, is good for catching the pollock, it's slow compared to the fishing speed, slower than the fishing speed of the salmon, or the swimming speed of the salmon. So the salmon can actually uh, um, get to this area here and swim out of the net without with uh, minimal loss of the pollock. Uh, and there's also light, light arrays around here that help attract the pollock, uh, excuse me, not the pollock, but the salmon to swim out. Uh, this has been going on, this is, project has been going on for several years. Um, the contributors are, some of this is, is vessel time, another is uh, fishing expertise. We have a retired uh, Bering Sea fisherman who, who lends the net expertise. Um, and I have a, now the video I'm going to show you is actually uh, of the escapement and how this would work. Um, You'll see a salmon in the center, but if you look down in the lower right, in just a few seconds, you'll see a salmon coming out of the cod end. And if you see him right here, there's your salmon, and he's going to peel off to the right, and that is him escaping from the net. So there's one less salmon caught in the net. And I'll, I'll run that again. This is from early preliminary studies. The plan was to put this, uh, it's actually gone out this summer with the uh, vessel observer uh, due to travel restrictions for NOAA scientists, the Vessel Observer actually conducted some of the data collection uh, for this project. Um, but that's proved to be, uh, there's, there's, there's good, there's high hopes for that project and how, how that will turn out. And then the last project I want to talk about, again, is electronic monitoring. Um, and this, this particular one has a, has a nice history. Um, this is electronic monitoring at the plants for salmon identification uh, during the offload. It's uh, using video analysis tools to validate um, 
salmon counts and to validate the salmon counts with uh, what was reported by the cannery as well as what was uh, found by uh, the, SC, the, the fishery observer at sea. And this can tie into um, bycatch reduction and stock assessment and, and in-season management. This has a good history uh, in, in Kodiak itself where uh, this started with the Alaska Groundfish Data Bank contacted uh, a private research company, uh, Fishnex Research, to look into just doing video monitoring of the offloads where you would record the offload uh, and then take that recording and then have someone sit and watch that and then count the salmon to validate, to verify the number of salmon reported at the plant. Well, the, they contacted Craig Rose and Craig Rose was also working on a separate project where he was working with uh, NOAA, with the, the observer program and their electronic monitoring group to do autonomous um, uh, uh, automated fish identification with video technology. So he was able to approach the people he was working with at NOAA and kind of as the go-between, say, hey, can we use this technology potentially to identify salmon during an offload? Uh, and then have that, thereby eliminating the need to have a person actually sit and watch it. And it would made for faster data reporting, uh, real-time data collection, and potentially, you know, and, and, and no loss of accuracy. Uh, and so that project, Took about two years to get rolling, but after working on it, uh, working with the computer programmers, get the algorithms just right, identifying the salmon, uh, what you ended up with, this is video I'm going to show you here. What you'll see is the rockfish. This is during a rockfish off of coming off the belt, and you'll see some red boxes appear here, and that is the computer identifying the salmon out of the catch and, uh, and, and document and counting it. You see the red box move along there's a salmon there and another one's a little slower but that's the computer program identifying the salmon out of the catch of the rockfish and this can also potentially be expanded to other species um it built off this built off another uh existing project that's been going on with shoot cameras on trawl vessels for identifying uh discards uh, it just built off this that another cooperative project so again this one again was going to go this year back into the plants there in Kodiak and, and go for another run. Uh, what they found is I think they have about 80, 80 upwards to 90 percent uh, accuracy in identifying and counting the, 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 the salmon during the, the offload process. So real successful for a first run and they're just hoping to improve upon that. And it's been delayed. I was talking to Craig just the other day who's one of the principal investigators on this and this has been delayed till 2021 but their, their plan is to go and, uh, and do this in, during the, the, the fisheries uh, in 2020, the rockfish fisheries coming up. So that's it for a summary of the, the projects we've had. Um, kind of moving toward the end of my talk here. Um, I want to talk to you guys about, you know, how, how to get involved in cooperative research. And if, if you're interested uh, with this, and the, the easiest thing to say is just reach out to uh, the Science Center. Reach out to NIMPS or FSC if you have contacts. Uh, reach out if you have an industry group that you work with. I know a lot of you, Alpha's one. Uh, BSFRF, which I mentioned as a Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation is, an, is another one. They have um, established research pr priorities, a lot of them. They also have contacts within NIMPS at, at AFSC. And just reach out and talk to these people. Like I said, we have an open door policy. We really support the Science Center is really supporting, really supports cooperative research. Uh, we definitely see it as a way forward um, for management of, you know, for working with Alaska Fisheries and management up there. Uh, and um, so if you have an idea or concern, you know, talk, talk to someone about it, talk to the science center, talk to your industry group. Um, and if you don't have those contacts, if you're not part of one of those groups, then, then you can reach out to, to me. This is my contact information. I'll have it again at the end of the presentation. Any kind of questions about these projects, any other projects we have going on, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm here at the science center and uh, would love, would, would love to help. Um, now, keep in mind these, these projects, I mentioned the, rockfish project before it was about two years from initial contact to getting that into the into the uh, plant but it did it did get done in two years is a relatively short time for some of these you know some of these projects we have some projects that go on for more than that there are projects that come together very quickly you know within just a few months um it just depends on the project and you, you know you don't know until you contact and get the ball rolling on that but uh really want to encourage you uh, you know to contact and and um and, you know, Alaska Science Center is very supportive of any kind of collaboration like that. Uh, where, what kind of projects might be more apt to be supported than others? You know, um, we have this pyramid here, and this is essentially the, the, the mission of the Science Center. This goes back to that science plan and the 
in the guidance memos. Um, what you see here is in the, the orange, the idea is in orange, you know, stock assessment, um, analysis and international obligations. Those are the must do's that we do at the Science Center every year. And then the blue is the things we'd like to do. And, you know, we think about funding, we do everything we can in the orange, then we move down into the blue. And the blue area, those things in the blue area, the, the bycatch analysis, uh, um, you know, data collection, uh, all those are great areas for innovation and for collaborative research and cooperation. And, uh, you know, anything that can be done can further into those. Those are the areas you, you can look into. Um, and we'd love to be working with, with anybody on that. Um, they said it fits into the strategic plan at the, in the, and, and with the annual you know, guidance mill. So we're supportive of that stuff. And we want to do projects that support the, the, the science plan and the guidance memo and the protocols because we want, you know, we really want to have projects that uh, we want, we want data that's actually going to be used in the fisheries management. Um, so we're supportive of any project, but those are the projects that we really uh, are helpful. And, and most projects fall into that quite easily. Um, and when you work, you know, a lot of people have ideas and, and observations, but um, sometimes you got to put the, if you work, you work with NOAA or you work with the fisheries, we can, or you work with your, you know, your, your representative group um, to get into a form where that can be used in, and applied in fisheries management. It's really important to do that, not skip that step. Uh, just quickly show this one slide because I want to remind people there are funding opportunities for, for research and project projects. Um, one of the easiest way to find out you know where those are is is go on the NOAA website and look for you know look for funding opportunities and, and click on Alaska. It's organized by region. I think currently there's there's five potential opportunities for where you can apply for grants uh, for research up there. This is this is not necessarily money funds that are available to uh, um, uh, AFSC. They're specifically set up for you know, stakeholders to, to look into, to get, to get access to. Uh, but we can, NOAA can work as a, as a partner on some of these projects. Uh, we can help with um, proposals and, uh, uh, and, and some of the priorities in the research and things. So just want to throw that out there. And then finally, um, looking towards the future, the idea is, you know, how can, uh, how can we get these collaborations going? How can we get this cooperation going? We have, um, you know, how can we improve communication? And we're, I'm open to ideas on that. We are, how can we, and how can we create opportunities to share ideas and identify mutual interests? Um, on the left side, you'll see, this is the uh, the flyer from the 2019 fish workshop that was con we had here. We hosted at the Science Center in Seattle last year. This is the Fisheries Innovation for Sustainable Harvest workshop. Uh, this is a, a, this is a really great a uh, little program that is was organized by and, and for the industry with the Science Center's Conservation Engineering Group um, hosting the meeting and uh, leading the organization of it. But it's essentially organized by the industry folks. And it's a, it, the idea is a workshop uh, to support industry by bringing them uh, knowledge that matters to them, packaged in a way that's most effective for them. And this kind of event is uh, it's about creating an opportunity to share ideas and, and, and identify the mutual interests with industry folks. And uh, out of these meetings, you know, ideas for cooperative partnerships may form, um, as well as getting a lot of good information across uh, to, to industry folks. Um, so things like this, are, they're out there. And, uh, uh, and we'd be interested in, in more things like this if, if there's an idea for it. Uh, a couple other things we want to do at the Science Center is continue to improve the uptake of new data in assessments and management. And what that really translates to is, you know, are there new ways that we can use our, observe, our fishery dependent data? Uh, is there a way also to use data from platforms of opportunity, you know, the, the citizen science or community science? Uh, we're really open to that. And then, um, you know, just generate new ideas and, and think about new ways to collect data. Uh, there's a lot of potential for citizen science or community science, excuse me, as we call it. And, uh, um, you know, it's just it's just reach out to us and, and we can we can work with you guys. Um, and then the last is uh, this is a goal of the Science Center with. Uh, Cooperative research is to move from uh, cooperative research projects to develop research plans with partners. So in other words, instead of looking at the canned one or two or three year projects, uh, we'd really like to work with some of these, you know, with the industry or with these groups uh, or communities to have long term multi year plans. Um, you know, the, you know, uh, incorporating you know these things into the into this into the science plan and our research goals. So this is some things to moving forward, some food for thought for everyone. 
And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for your attention and for this opportunity. And i will be glad to answer any questions. Thanks Hopefully so you much. guys can hear me. <laughs> yeah, we've got you. Um, so okay. I'm checking with my team right now for any additional questions that might have come in during the presentation. I don't have any in front of me right now. But just as a reminder to everyone tuning in, you can submit questions to chamber at Kodiak.org. You can give us a call at 907-486-5557. Or if you're on Facebook or YouTube watching the video, you can just make a comment right on the video. If for some reason you happened to miss your opportunity and you're not watching this video live, please still feel free to make those comments or give us a call. We're happy to connect you with the presenters who supplied all, all the information from today and get those questions and make those connections happen for you. So, Paul, I don't see that anything else has come in since okay. we uh, ended. So if, if you'd like to add any final thoughts or anything else, You've got just a couple minutes and then we will uh, wrap up the, the final information for the day. Yeah, no, I just th thank you for the, uh, let's see if I can, if, I don't know if they can see me, but just thank you for the opportunity and um, yeah, feel free to anyone to reach out at any time. And uh, I appreciate this. I'm glad you guys got this, this going up there. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Have a great evening. And from there, we are going to go ahead and just transition into a summary of what we can expect tomorrow. Please be sure to join us at 10 a.m. right where you're joining us right now. That might be Facebook, YouTube, or our website, comfishak.com. We've got some really fantastic forums set up for you tomorrow. We are going to start off at 10 a.m. with the Alaska Unified Command update with Tom Koloski. Next up, we will have from 1045 to 1145 updates from the Office of the Governor and the State of Alaska Fish and Game. We're going to have presenters uh, John Muller and the Commissioner of Fish and Game, uh, Doug Vincent Lang, with us. And then we are going to go ahead at 2 o'clock. We'll, we'll have a short break between sessions at 2 o'clock. We'll have an update from Senator, uh, from Representative Louis Stutes, as well as Senator Gary Stevens. And then we will have two final presentations. We'll have a pre-recorded presentation from Ted Tusky, a comprehensive look at non-fatal injuries and illnesses among Alaska fishermen, as well as a final presentation to close out the day at 3.15 by Adam Smood, boat batteries, the backbone of your electrical system, the do's and don'ts. So we've got a whole great set of a lineup for tomorrow and we are ready to have you join us then. We have a few final notes. I am happy to confirm officially that we have finalized the dates for Comfish Alaska 2021. So even though we're here right now in September, we are looking forward to seeing all of you here in Kodiak, not virtually, but actually physically here in Kodiak for our trade show and our forum presentations from March 18th through the 20th. Again, we're striving. We've got some really creative new ideas to try and host that trade show so that our commercial fishing community does not have to go without. We wanna make sure that you get the services that you need to be able to have the most successful season that you can. Before I sign off, I have two more things I'd like to share with you. One is a completely shameless plug for us. Uh, this year, we have we we aren't making money off of Comfish Alaska. Typically, we are able to sell some vendor booths to be able to help finance some of these forums and keep the chamber going. So instead, if you appreciate what we're doing and you like what you're seeing and want to help continue. Uh, to have us do that in 2021, we ask that you just do a quick support to us by maybe buying some apparel. I've got my Comfish Alaska fleece on, we have some stickers, and we have pins, and we have a nice long sleeve shirt. A really cute thing that we added to our inventory this year are some extra tough socks. Uh, they do not say extra tough, they are a knockoff, we'll say, but all of that is available on our shop online. So if you go to comfishak.com, we do have that available for purchase. You just use your credit card, let us know the address to ship it to, and you're going to be all set and decked out in your Comfish gear, ready to go for next year. The last resource that I wanted to share is actually, uh, let me see, let me find it here. 
That is not the one. <laughs> I apologize, let me find this. I have a website that I wanted to share with everyone. Here we go, here it is. So uh, a lot of our commercial fishing community is suffering. They need some resources to help them through. And Swampsea has actually put together a really fantastic program that's sort of a one-stop shop for our commercial fishermen to be able to find any of the resources that they might need, whether it be about policy or finance or funding opportunities, grants or loans. Uh, if you go ahead and go to swamc.org and you can click on the COVID resources and then this forward program. The forward program is a really straightforward, simple way for you to find out about all the programs that, that you qualify for as a commercial fisherman or processor in the industry right now. So you go ahead, just enter your information. They've made it really simple and nice and easy to access. They're gonna find a lot of opportunities for you that you maybe didn't know were available. So we wanna help our fishing community. That's what Comfish is all about, is making sure that we give our fishing community the resources that they need throughout the entire year. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off for the day. Don't forget, join us at 10 a.m. tomorrow. We look forward to seeing you then.